Today we will talk about the most important organ, most delicate organ of your body which is the brain. You know that brain is a part of your central nervous system. Brain and spinal cord, those two organs belong to the central nervous system. Since the brain is a very delicate, sensitive organ, very important organ, it is heavily protected by a number of structures. So first, we will see how your brain is protected in your body. Which structures protect the brain? Inside the brain, you have fluid filled cavities. Those cavities are called ventricles. So, ventricles are fluid filled cavities inside the brain. So, we will see the location and name of those ventricles. Then we will talk about the parts of the brain. How we divide the whole brain into different parts. Then we will talk about the structure of the brain. If you cut the brain, you will see outer layer which is called the cortex is grey and inner part looks white. So outer layer or the cortex is called the grey matter and inner white part is called the white matter. In last lecture, I have mentioned why grey area looks grey, white area looks white. Then we will talk about the functional areas in the brain. You know that on the surface of your cerebrum you have many areas Many areas are located on the surface of the brain or cerebrum. For example, in the back of the brain, you have visual area. So from the eye, the visual signal, the sight goes to the back of the brain, right? Here, you have the auditory. So from the ear, the sound signal goes here. So there are many functional areas are present on the surface of the cerebrum. What we will do, we will just see few important, very important surface areas or functional areas okay, and their locations, not all. Then we will talk about something very interesting that is called Homunculi. Homunculi are your own body map in your brain. So whole body map is present in the brain. So we will see where in the brain homunculi or body maps are located. Make sense? So those are the things we will go over. First, the structures protect the brain. Your brain is heavily protected. If you see from outside to inside, there are a number of structures. Outermost structure is the scalp or skin on the head. Then 
under the skin or scalp you have the periosteum you know that covering of the bone is called periosteum peri means around osteum means bone so periosteum that covers the bone and then you have the skull bones or cranial bone under the bone you have meninges membranes meninges are connective tissue membranes and there are three meninges or three membranes under the bone outermost one is called the dura mater middle one is arachnoid mater and innermost one is the pia mater so first is the skull then the periosteum then you have the bone so this is the skull bone then under the bone you have meninges how many layers in meninges three outermost meninges is called the dura mater and dura mater remember is the thickest one among those three thickest and toughest one is the dura mater because that's the outermost one it protects uh the brain so this is dura then there is another membrane that is called the arachnoid mater so arachnoid mater is the middle one middle meninges and then you have the innermost one which is called the pia mater so this is the innermost one which is very thin and attached to the surface of the brain directly so this is the brain tissue brain and this is the pia mater very thin membrane attached to the surface of the brain difficult to separate so this is the pia mater so those are three meninges now above the dura mater this space that means between the skull bone and dura mater there is a space this space is called epidural space ep means above so this space is called ep dural space under the bone but above the dura mater in this space lot of blood vessels are located so many blood vessels are present in this space sometime uh, blood can accumulate in epidural space if any rupture of those blood vessels occur due to any accident or anything then bleeding occurs and blood accumulates in that <laughs> space so if blood accumulates in this space epidural space that is called epidural hematoma epidural 
Rural Emma Toma Accumulation of blood in the epidural space. Under the dura mater, there is another space. So, above the dura mater, you have epidural space. Under the dura mater, you have another space that is called subdural space. So, this space is Sub, sub means under dural space. If blood accumulates here in this space, that is called subdural hematoma. That can also happen. So, epidural space, epidural hematoma, subdural space, subdural hematoma. Then the arachnoid matter which is very soft and in arachnoid matter there are a lot of villi finger like extensions like going like this a lot of finger like structures hanging from the arachnoid matter like this villi like structure and this membrane middle one is soft under the arachnoid matter this space is called subarachnoid space make sense and this subarachnoid space is very important because cerebrospinal fluid is present in subarachnoid space. So, in this space, you have cerebrospinal fluid or CSF. This fluid flows in this space. Okay. Then the innermost is the thinnest one, here matter, as I mentioned, is attached to the surface of the brain, very thin, and you did dissection of the brain, Shippen, uh, I showed you uh, the PM matter, I took the pin and just, you can peel it, but very closely attached to the surface of the brain. Okay, so those are the structures protect from any mechanical injury. If something tries to hit from outside right, those structures will prevent your brain from getting injury. There is another structure that is called the blood brain barrier. Blood brain barrier, BBB, is it to remember? Blood brain barrier is providing protection from the chemicals. You know, chemicals can also cause harm to your brain. A lot of toxic chemicals are present in the blood. You know that, right? So, those toxic chemicals can cause harm to your brain. So, Blood brain barrier protects the brain from those toxic chemicals present in the blood. That's why it is called blood brain barrier. Now, what is that? In the brain, you have the capillaries. So, these are capillaries in the brain. And inside the capillary, you have the blood and outside of the capillary you have the brain tissue. So, blood is flowing inside the capillary and outside of the capillary you have the neurons, uh, neuroglial cells, brain tissue, okay? highly sensitive. So, what happens, this capillary wall, you must remember from my last lecture, astrocyte, one type of neuroglial cells, star-like, do you remember? They send foot like extensions and that covers the capillaries. So, around the capillaries in the brain you have an extra layer formed by the astrocytes. You don't have this extra layer in other part of the body, only in the brain capillaries. And that's why the capillary wall 
of the brain is less permeable, will not let toxic chemicals to get out from the blood, which is very important because we know that brain tissue is very sensitive, right? So, if toxic chemicals can easily get out from the blood, enter into the brain tissue, will cause harm to the brain, okay? So, that's why you have an extra layer around the capillary in the brain formed by the astrocytes. So, that's the blood-brain barrier, capillary wall with that covering of astrocyte. Okay. <clears throat> that means what? That means uh, most of the toxic chemicals are prevented there, right? Will not be allowed to enter into the brain tissue. Uh, Blood-brain barrier is also helping you. You know, often we take medicine, right? All different kinds of medicine, pain medicine or this medicine, that medicine, uh, medicine for the liver or kidney or stomach. Those medicines, medicine molecules should not go to the brain tissue. So, the blood brain barrier will stop them. If everything, all medicines you are taking every time, those chemicals go to the brain, will cause problem. Okay. So, now, those medicines, the manufacturers will make that should work on the brain. They have to do what? They have to see the blood brain barrier. Make sense? And make sure that those medicine molecules can pass through the blood brain barrier and work on the brain tissue. So, they have to study the blood brain barrier first, right? And then make the molecules that can cross the blood brain barrier to work on the brain tissue. So, that's the blood brain barrier. <coughs> Venticles, fluid filled cavities inside the brain. And inside your brain, there are two lateral ventricles, one third ventricle and one fourth ventricle. Lateral ventricles are largest and all those ventricles are connected. So, the fluid can go from one ventricle to another. They are not separated, they are connected, which is good because If fluid accumulates in one ventricle, the excess fluid can enter or go to another ventricle. Otherwise, the pressure will rise inside the ventricle. So, now we will see the location and how the ventricles are connected. If you see from the front, of the head or brain. In the left side picture is showing the location of those ventricles if you look from the through the front. That means two lateral ventricles are like this, although these are inside the brain, like this, and then third ventricle, fourth ventricle. If you see from the side, the lateral ventricles are like this. One is in this hemisphere, another is in that hemisphere. And these two are lateral ventricles and then the third ventricle, fourth ventricle and they are connected to each other. Lateral ventricles are connected to the third ventricle by interventricular foramen and third ventricle is connected to the fourth by cerebral aqueda that narrow tube that passes, cerebral aqueduct. So, now, uh, if you see inside the ventricle, so this is your brain, this is the lateral ventricle, cerebrospinal fluid is inside the ventricle and a capillary structure, a coiled capillary structure that is called 
following. Choroid is a capillary plexus which is attached to the wall of the ventricle, usually attached to the roof or ceiling of the ventricle. And this capillary structure, choroid, secretes the cerebrospinal fluid continuously. Secret the cerebrospinal fluid into the ventricle. And also in the wall of the ventricle, you have, we have talked about this in last lecture, you have one type of neuroglial cells, those are called ependymal cells, you must remember, they have cilia, soft hair like cilia, and the cilia of the ependymal cells always beat like this, move like this. So, a current is always present in the fluid. So, that helps the fluid to move. So, always new secretion is coming from the choroid plexus and old fluid is getting out. So, circulation of fluid occurs uh, there. Okay, so now, uh, Sometimes, what can happen? Brain tumor, for example, if any tumor is formed around the cerebral aqueduct or interventricular foramen in that area, that tumor can block the passage connection. And in that case, what will happen? The fluid will not be able to get out. Make sense? if the connections get closed because of tumor around it, then the fluid will start to accumulate inside the ventricle. No passes to get out. So what will happen? The ventricles will start to get big. Make sense? Fluid accumulating ventricles will get big, big, big and that will make the brain bigger. And that condition is called hydrocephalus. Hydro means water or fluid. Uh, schizophrenia is a very complicated disease. Schizophrenia could occur due to many, many factors. Not any, there is no specific factors that enlargement of the ventricle will do that. But indirect studies like, you know, schizophrenic patient, if you um, take, you know, brain image from 1000 patient and compare, yes, it, it has shown some studies that the ventricle is larger. But that doesn't directly connect uh, to the cause of schizophrenia. Schizophrenia could be due to many other other uh, brain diseases, brain problems. Uh, so, uh, due to accumulation of fluid, when the brain enlarges, uh, that is hydrocephalus. You know, cephalic part means the head part, we say, right? Cephalic area, head and hydro means water or fluid. So, that is hydrocephalus. Now, in hydrocephalus, you will see in infants, the head gets bigger. But head does not get enlarged in adults. Why? Because, right, in infants, you know, the cranial bones are still not fused, right? So, there are soft areas in between the cranial bones. Did you notice that? Uh, the movement of the brain you can see, right? Because soft tissue is in between the bones, growing bones. So, what happens when the head gets bigger, the cranium, the bones move away because 
there are soft areas in between. So the skull can get bigger. And you can see from outside that head is getting bigger, right? So easy to diagnose. In adults, if that happens, then it will be difficult to diagnose, right? Because the skull bones are already fused. There is no space to expand. The sutures are fixed joints, right? Will not move. Immovable joints. So the head will stay same, but brain is trying to get expanded. So in that case, the brain tissue will push against the skull bone. And that could be more dangerous. In infants, it's easy. You can see and you can drain the fluid out, right? So the pressure will go down. But in adults, it is other complications occur before you diagnose. So that's the hydrocephalus. <clears throat> Uh, spinal fluid. The cerebrospinal fluid is secreted from the choroid plexus that I just mentioned and the cord plexus is usually hang from the roof or ceiling of the ventricles. Cerebrospinal fluid plays some important roles. One is protection, providing cushioning. You know, around your brain and the spinal cord, in subarachnoid space, we have talked about that, you have cerebrospinal fluid around the brain as well as around the spinal cord, right? In subarachnoid space. Now, uh, you know, when you ride a roller coaster, right? The roller coaster moves suddenly from one direction to another. Your head is moving, right? Quickly. That fluid around the brain, cerebrospinal fluid, protects your brain. So brain won't hit the hard skull bone because of the fluid. If you didn't have any fluid around, then every time you suddenly move the head, the brain would have hit the skull, right? And that would be dangerous. So cerebrospinal fluid is a very good protection uh, to your brain. Cerebrospinal fluid also contains nutrients and neurochemicals. Chemical signals are present in the cerebrospinal fluid. So, keeps the brain healthy and performing the signal transmission. Here you see uh, the flow of the cerebrospinal fluid from the ventricles, cerebrospinal fluid gets out and enters into the subarachnoid space. So these are the ventricles. So from there, enter into the subarachnoid space. You see here. So this is the subarachnoid space. This is the arachnoid matter, subarachnoid space circulates there and also from the ventricles cerebrospinal fluid enters into the central canal of the spinal cord. In the center of the spinal cord there is a narrow canal or passes. So cerebrospinal fluid enters into the spinal cord. <coughs> Okay, so that's the flow of the cerebrospinal fluid. You remember I mentioned that in arachnoid matter, arachnoid matter, the middle layer of meninges is soft and there are villi. You remember that? Finger like. So those villi absorb the cerebrospinal fluid. So the plexus, capillary plexus, choroids are secreting and villi absorb the cerebrospinal fluid. Parts of the brain. Your brain consists of four parts. How many? Four. Parts. Uh, 
Okay, so this is the brain and when you look at the brain at your first look at a glance, the largest part you see, this is called the cerebrum, this big part. It's called what? Cerebrum. And it, it, is a hem, uh, it is a sphere. Cerebrum is a sphere. And it consists of two hemispheres, two halves, separated by, you see, this fissure, longitudinal fissure, right? Along the mid sagittal line. So, cerebrum is the largest part of the brain. It is a sphere, consists of how many hemispheres? Two sphere will con consist of two hemispheres of and separated by longitudinal fissure. So that is one largest part. Then in the bottom of the back part of the cerebrum, so this is the back of the cerebrum, in the bottom of that you have another structure that is called the cerebellum, this one. And then from the bottom of the cerebrum, a stem arises, you know, the stem of the tree like that arises, goes downwards, it is, this is called the brain stem, make sense, brain stem. And then diencephalon is the part located inside the brain. So three parts you can see from outside, but diencephalon is inside. So those are four parts. Cerebrum, cerebellum, brainstem, and diencephalon. Now, uh, cerebrum is separated from the cerebellum by this deep sulcus. This is called the transverse fissure. So transverse fissure separating cerebrum and cerebellum and longitudinal fissure separates two hemispheres. Make sense? Okay. Now, <coughs> cerebral hemisphere, each hemisphere, this is one hemisphere, left hemisphere, right? Has four lobes. Here, by four different colors, you can see those four lobes. In the front, you have the frontal lobe. Behind the frontal lobe, this blue area, that's the parietal lobe. And behind that, this is the occipital lobe. And below the frontal and parietal lobe, this lobe is called the temporal lobe. So these lobes are named after the bones, right? So these bones are kind of covering those lobes. For example, this is frontal bone, you know that, right? So frontal lobe is here. Temporal bone. So under the temporal bone, it's more or less, you have the temporal lobe. Here you have what? Parietal lobe. And in the back, you have the occipital lobe. Yes. Oh, it's mostly Yeah. In some books, uh, they mentioned five lobes. In some books, four lobes. Insula is a small part in the inner surface and somewhere here. And that is responsible more like taste and smell signal. But if I ask you, just say four lobes. Okay. okay. Now, um, so each hemisphere has four lobes and the surface of the cerebrum, the outer surface is called the cerebral cortex. So outer surface of the cerebrum is called the, so if this is a cerebral hemisphere, outer part is called the cortex. Cerebral cortex. Cerebral cortex. And I mentioned before, the outer cortex is gray matter. Looks gray. Why? Because in this area, 
all the cell bodies of neurons and the dendrites are here. In last class I mentioned that in gray matter you have all the cell bodies and then the axons go inwards and these axons are covered by myelin sheet, right? White myelin sheet, that's why this area looks white. This is white matter, this is gray matter. Because inside the cell body you have the missile granules, missile bodies. Okay. So outer part or outer layer is the cortex, which is the gray matter, and inner part is the white matter. And now you know why. Okay. Now <coughs> the function of the cerebrum. What's the function of this largest part of the brain? On the surface of the cerebrum, that means in the cerebral cortex, you have many functional areas. In the back, you see this yellow area. This is called the primary visual cortex. That means your visual signal is processed there. Then another one you see here, just the upper part of the temporal lobe. This is the lateral sulcus, by the way. At the bank of the lateral sulcus, in the upper part of the temporal lobe, this small area, that's the primary auditory cortex here. So, your auditory signal, sound signal is processed there. <coughs> you see here, this in the middle of the hemisphere, there is a sulcus. This sulcus is important. There are many sulci here, you see everywhere, but this is one important sulcus that is separating the frontal and parietal lobes. So this sulcus is called the central sulcus. Central sulcus. And so this is the central sulcus. In front of the central sulcus, this area is called precentral gyrus. And behind the central sulcus, this area is called postcentral gyrus. Pre is before, post is after. Make sense? So before precentral, after postcentral gyrus. So precentral gyrus. Pre-central gyrus is primary motor cortex. That means the main motor cortex is pre-central gyrus. This one, front of the central sulcus. And this post central gyrus, this one, blue one, is primary somatosensory cortex. Post central gyrus is primary means what? Main one. So, precentral and postcentral. Precentral is primary motor cortex, postcentral is primary somatosensory cortex. Those two are very important functional areas. Primary motor, motor area or cortex controls the movement, motor. Okay? Motor does what? Movement. So, that's the main area in the brain that controls the movement, regulates the movement. And primary somatosensory, what are the somatosensations? Pain, touch, temperature, those you feel in the skin. Pain, touch, temperature. 
those signals are processed in the somatosensory cortex. So those are two very important functional areas. Anyway, so just know that in the cerebral hemisphere on the surface you have a number of functional areas. That is the function of the cerebral hemisphere. Now, we'll talk about diencephalon. Diencephalon has three parts. Thalamus and below the thalamus you have the hypo thalamus and below the hypothalamus you have the pituitary gland. So those three structures form the diencephalon. I'll just mention one or two function of each you have to remember. Thalamus is called the major sensory relay station. So this one, thalamus, is the main sensory relay station. Have you seen relay race? So one person runs and gives a stick to the next person, he then runs, right? So the signal from one group of neuron is given to another group of neurons. That I cannot go that far. You now take the signal and take it further, okay? So inside the thalamus, most of the sensory relay occurs. Like from your eye, one group of neurons from the retina taking the signal to the thalamus and giving the signal to another group of neurons and telling the thalamus, now you send it, I can't, yeah, I can't go that far, okay. So exactly same thing happens, most of the sensory signals will go to the thalamus and a relay will occur, for example, touch, pain, temperature, all those are sensory signals, right, your smell, your hearing, those signal are relayed in the thalamus. So that's why it is called the major sensory relay station. Hypothalamus. Hypothalamus is very important. You have um, heard this name before. Anybody remember where did you hear? A few days ago. Not uh, also you uh, in the lecture too. Regulation of body temperature. Remember now? Okay. It sends signal to the sweat gland and blood vessels of the skin to sweat and dilate. So hypothalamus, number one, regulation of body temperature. Number two, hypothalamus regulates the pituitary gland because you remember I just said that pituitary is below the hypothalamus. So what happens in the brain, this is the hypothalamus and pituitary is just under the hypothalamus. So this is pituitary gland. And what happens from the hypothalamus, these are the neurons in the hypothalamus, send signal to the pituitary. Okay. And the pituitary will then release the, secret the hormones, okay. So hypothalamus is just sitting above the pituitary gland and regulating the pituitary secretion. So very important. We know that pituitary gland, what's the function of pituitary gland? Pituitary gland, gland will secret hormone but it is called what? Master gland, right? So it is boss of glands. But it has a boss too. Who is pituitary's boss? Hypothalamus. Okay. 
The boss has a boss too. <laughs> okay. So, that is number two. Control the pituitary secretion. Number three, hypothalamus regulates the food and water intake. Intake of food and water. That is something interesting, right? How much you will eat and drink. That is controlled by hypothalamus. How? You all know that when you are very thirsty, right? You are very thirsty, you, you think that I will drink a lot, right? Whatever I get, I will drink a lot. When you are very hungry, you think I will eat a lot. Then you start to eat and drink, right? And after a few minutes, you start to lose interest. Uh, then at one point, you stop eating. Even if I say eat more, you won't eat. Right? That happens every time. So, something is in your brain which is telling you, right? Inhibiting you. That is the hypothalamus. Hypothalamus has the receptors that can uh, uh, detect in your blood how much glucose is there, how much water is there. Thirst center has osmoreceptors, right? They can detect in your blood the water and nutrients, sugar, glucose, how much there. If it says saturated enough, then we'll send inhibition. Okay? So you won't feel it anymore. So now um, there are few interesting research you can go online and see. Uh, scientists, they took two groups of rats or mice, okay, same size, and in one group they have made lesion in the hypothalamus, destroyed part of hypothalamus. In another group, they did not do anything, anything, control, and let them eat and drink all the time and as they wish, and let them grow. And after a month, they found that the group got hypothalamus lesion, lesion in the hypothalamus, that group got like this big. <laughs> because they don't know where to stop eating and drinking. That function has been lost. No inhibition. The other group is healthy and fine, but this group is like, this group is this big, mice, and this group is this. Okay? So, in human also, uh, there are clinical conditions where you will see the patients eat all the time. Doesn't know where to stop and get obese. Yeah. They can detect the fluid. Check the fluid. How much, you know, water molecules are there, concentration of fluid in the body. Yeah, there are several centers. Okay. So, just remember those few things that I mentioned about hypothalamus. Then, pituitary gland is called the master gland. It regulates the secretion of other glands of the body. Okay, so that's the diencephalon. Now, we'll see the brain stem. Brain stem consists of three structures or parts. Midbrain, pons, and medulla oblongata. These are three parts of the brain stem. Do you remember uh, when you dissected the sheep brain? I showed you midbrain, pons, medulla oblongata. You also must remember, I showed you the back of the midbrain. There are four round structures, upper two are bigger, lower two are smaller, right? Mm -hmm. Superior colliculi, inferior colliculi, together called corpora quadrigemina. Superior, two superior colliculi process what? Visual. Inferior colliculi process auditory. So, those signals visual, 
auditory those signals are processed in the midbrain superior and inferior colliculi pons and medulla oblongata so this is pons this is medulla oblongata you have control regulatory centers regulatory centers these centers are very important in the pons and medulla you have that means in the brain stem you have the important regulatory centers for example cardiac center respiratory centers so cardiac and respiratory centers are located in the pons and medulla that is very important you know if the brain stem is destroyed then what will happen the person will die because you have the heart cardiac centers and respiratory centers there from there the signal is going to the heart and uh, pons and medulla for example one respiratory center is in the pons another two are in the medulla but just uh, uh, it's okay if you just say that in the brain stem you have the control centers or regulatory centers for the heart and the respiration okay the reflex center also some reflex centers are in the brain stem like you know if i put flash light on your eye your eye will do what people will constrict right reflex that goes to the brain stem comes back so some important reflex centers are there uh then the cerebellum cerebellum is this part you know this is the cerebellum and this structure uh, just know that is responsible for maintaining the balance and equilibrium of the body so your body balance when you walk or run or stand your body balance and equilibrium are maintained by the cerebellum and if you train your cerebellum from your childhood then your balance is better right so uh, those people like we'll see the chinese girls they can walk on the road right? very balanced uh, because they are trained from their childhood ways when they are small and their cerebellum develops that way okay so uh, they have much better balance uh so just know those couple of functions of each surface marking on the cerebrum you see here on the surface of the cerebrum you have many shallow grooves many these shallow grooves are called what sulci or sulci sulci color card yeah so these shallow groups you have seen uh, in dissection too many sulcus is singular sulci is plural and so on the surface if i just cut this way shallow groups like this and then you will see few deep groups so these shallow groups are called sulci and deep groove or cut is called fissure now in between two sulci the area 
So this is one sulcus. This is another sulcus. This area is called a gyrus. So now I can say on the surface of the cerebrum you have many sulci and many gyri. Gyri is plural. In between the sulci you have gyri. Some people say gyri. That's also fine. So I'll see. So, <laughs> so gyri. Sulci. So in human we have more sulci than other creatures. More sulci means what? The surface area is bigger, right? There's more foldings. So if you make it straight, a big surface area. That means more neurons in the cortex, right? That means better processing, more functions. So that's why human brain is smarter. Um, the surface area is much bigger even though some creatures have big brain but the groups are less ok now uh, here you see they have shown uh, the central sulcus I showed you already separates the frontal and parietal lobes. And this central sulcus is very important because in front of it you have the precentral gyrus behind postcentral gyrus and I mentioned the function of those two. Precentral is primary motor, postcentral is primary somatosensor. Here you can also see uh, the lateral sulcus above the temporal lobe. This is the lateral so these are the important circuit. This is the lateral, this is the central. Okay. Insula is uh, in, inside if you if you separate the temporal and the lobes above like this, the area you will be able to see that's the insula where the taste signal and some smell signals, those are processed. Here you see the functional areas in the cerebrum. I mentioned that a uh, few important functional areas you need to know. One is the primary visual in the back. Here you can see. You see the primary auditory above the temporal lobe. You see the precentral gyrus, postcentral gyrus. Those are another two important functional areas. Another one you see here in the middle of the frontal lobe here shown by the dotted line that area is called the Broca's area. Broca's was a French neurologist. Broca's area. This area is responsible for the production of speech, speech production when you speak. Signal goes from the broadcast area to the vocal cord, make sense, to the vocal cord. Uh, he had a patient, Dr. Brockas had a patient and once that patient got stroke and he lost his ability to speak, his speech got lost. So after the death of that patient, uh, Dr. Brockas, he took the brain of that patient out and examined under the microscope extensively. At that time, they did not have MRI or you know CT scan. So under the microscope and he found that in that area that patient got lesion. So he first proposed that that area is responsible for the production of speech. 
then other scientists they confirm. So that area has been named after him. If you go to uh, British Museum, uh, Broca's brain is also after his death they have preserved. It. Uh, in the back, you see another dotted area. That area is called Wernicke's area. Wernicke's area is also related to speech. Also related to speech, but this area is responsible for understanding speech, not production of speech, but but understanding another person's speech. So two different things, right? When you want to produce speech, Broca's area helps, right? But when you are listening another person is talking with you, then signal goes where? Right to the Broca's area. Because you are not producing sound. You are listening, right? And trying to understand. So you see those two areas are far away from each other. And both are related to speech, but two different functions. Production of speech and recognizing on and understanding the speech. So if lesion occurs in Wernicke's areas, that patient will be able to produce the speech because his Broca's area is fine, but he will have problem in understanding what other people are saying. Okay? So he will be able to produce speech from his memory. Okay. Uh, in general, the whole prefrontal area of frontal lobe, this whole area is responsible for higher order brain functions. Now, that means there are lower order brain functions too, right? So, what's the difference between higher order and lower order brain functions? What do you think? Right. Very good. Yeah. Uh, intelligence, right? right? Emotion, you said, thinking, doing math. Uh, those are higher order brain functions. Human, human uh, is better in higher order functions, right? Uh, but they do bad judgment too. <laughs> okay. Not always good. Corrupted. Yeah, decision making, definitely. Critical thinking. That's why the frontal lobe in human brain is bigger. You, if you even see elephant head or big creature head uh, brain, the frontal lobe is small. In human, it is bigger. Now, lower order brain functions are what? What do you think? Those are not related to thinking. Breathing, your heart regulation of your heart, right? Your uh, uh, urinary reflex, your defecation reflex, you have to do every day. All animals do that same way. So those are lower order brain functions. Yes. Limbic system is very much related to emotion and uh, memory. So. Uh, limbic system is in the middle. So it gets signal from the frontal lobe as well as it sends signal to the lower order, order area. So it's kind of in between. But a lot of higher order functions are processed in the amygdala and other parts of the limbic system, hippocampus. Okay, so uh, now you have seen that some areas are motor areas, for example, primary motor cortex, right? Some areas are sensory areas, for example, visual, auditory, somatosensory cortex. Some areas, there are some areas in the brain, those are called association areas. There are many association areas. The name is telling you, right? Association. So, two or different 
functional areas send signal to the association area and where those signals are combined. That's why called association. So two or more areas signal go to the association area where the signal is combined. Now let me give you a uh, simple example. A simple example. When I am speaking, right? You are looking at me. So your visual signal is going from the eye to the visual cortex here, right? Remember? In the back of the brain. There. At the same time, you are doing what? You are listening, right? So from your ear, signal is going to the auditory cortex. Your auditory cortex is here. Your visual cortex is there, right? Those two signals are going simultaneously to the brain. But they must talk to each other to make sense. So there must be another area where the signal from those two are going and being combined. Otherwise, it will not make sense to me. Those two things should be combined together. If you see me, I am moving my mouth and hand speaking, but sound is coming from that skeleton. <laughs> what will happen? You will get confused, right? So, every day, lot of, you know, information are going to the brain simultaneously and those are being combined to make sense. So, very important uh, that association areas uh, do that. Here, uh, they have shown the gray matter and white matter. You know, in the cerebrum, outer layer is the cortex, which is the gray matter, and inner is the white matter. In the base stem and spinal cord, if you make cross section, you'll see the outer part is the white matter. It's kind of opposite. Outer area is the white matter. Inner part is the gray matter. That means the cell bodies of neurons are in the center part, inner part. Medial aspect of the hemisphere. This is the medial side. So here you have few structures. You see this band, white band. This is the corpus callosum, right? You have seen that. And corpus callosum holds two hemispheres together. Holds two hemispheres together. And corpus callosum is like a band and through the corpus callosum, the fibers from one hemisphere go to the other side. So, you see here, inside the, if you see inside the corpus callosum, you see fibers are going like this. From this hemisphere, fibers are going to that. From that hemisphere, fibers are going to so, cross it like this through the corpus callosum. Very important. You know, you have how many eyes? Two. So, from this eye, signal goes to this visual cortex. This eye, this visual cortex, right? Each eye is seeing half, right? Of the visual field. So, they must be combined. So, those two centers must talk to each other through the corpus callosum. So, two hemispheres, there are many areas, they are always talking to each other through the fibers passing through the corpus callosum. Make sense? Okay. So, uh, now uh, corpus callosum could be sometimes problematic. Sorry. <laughs> you know, uh, epilepsy. Yeah, epilepsy. Uh, Usually, we control the patients uh, by medicine, right? But sometimes, if it is uncontrollable, the patient may die due to epilepsy. Uh, callosectomy, we cut the corpus callosum. So, that can reduce the spread of epilepsy. Because, you know, what happens in epilepsy, uh, the neurons of certain area start to burst, fire very excited right? and from those neurons the signal go to the muscles and cause convulsion or seizure right now from those bad neurons signal can go to the other side right and spread in this side too through 
through the copper skeleton. So sometimes it works if you split the copper skeleton, so signal will not go to the healthy side, not go to the other side. That can uh, help. How does that work with regards? In general, uh, mostly it's like uh, uh, I gave you the example, like combining two signals from your right left eye, from your ear. You uh, will, if you learn more, I don't want to spend too much time. Binocular disparity. If you close and open your right and left eye, you see your right and left eye are seeing the things in slightly different location, like this. So, that difference, your brain must measure to give you the depth. So, that is simply one example. So, it won't be, that. Awesome. Won't be able to do that. The difference will, will not be, yeah, so brain will not be able to calculate that. Okay. So, uh, multiple complications will occur. Corpus skeletal uh, dissection, but the patient will, the person will not die. The problem is coordination, like balance. The body balance could get lost because two motor cortices must talk to each other, right? So the person may lose the body balance. Okay, uh, so that is corpus callosum, and another structure you see here uh, below the corpus callosum. That's uh, the phonix. Phonics is here, this white one, this phonics, right, you remember you have seen this in dissection, this phonics and the memory body, these two structures, uh, they did not show memory body here, no, okay, so anyway, uh, the phonics is responsible for memory recall related to memory recalling. Then below the phonics you have the thalamus and hypothalamus. See here. Last thing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I want to finish. So, homunculi. Interesting. Maps. Your whole body map in the brain. Where those body maps are present, you see, you remember, precentral gyrus and postcentral gyrus. Precentral is primary motor, postcentral is primary somatosensory. I showed you here. In these two gyri, you have the whole body map and that map is called homunculus. Homunculi is plural. So now in one sentence I can say that the entire body map in your primary motor and primary somatosensory cortices. Now this is your somatosensory gyrus. This one. They have dissected this way. So if you start from here, this is the somatosensory gyrus, you know that. Now if I start from here, this part is representing your foot here. And then if you go like this, your foot is here, then the leg, right, thigh, then trunk, and the hand, and then the face. Now you see, which areas are represented in bigger part? Head and the hands, right? Head and hands are in the larger area of the brain. So, do you think this map is proportionate to your body? No. Is it proportionate map? No. no. It, now, if I join them, it will look like a dwarf. 
<laughs> trunk is very small, you see? Trunk is very small. <laughs> so that word homunculus means dwarf person. Yeah? So uh, you have how many in each hemisphere? How many homunculus? In each you have two. So one yeah, because this is motor cortex, this is somatosensory cortex. You have whole map. So now I can say that homunculus is a disproportionate body map in those two gyri. Make sense? Interestingly, these maps have plasticity. That means if a person uses his fingers a lot, like a person plays piano, has played piano last 30 years, very good in piano. If you see his map, his finger areas are bigger than others. That means use dependent map. It expands if you use that area more. Rose. If you, if, you, if you don't use, I, I, I performed a number of experiments on raccoons. You know raccoons? Yeah. Raccoons use these two fingers a lot, right? So these two fingers are very clear in that map, in the brain. Yeah, you can tell this uh, finger and this finger area. They are separated by sulcate. Now, what I did, I denervated this finger. Surgically, I removed this finger. And after a few weeks, but I have found that entire this finger area here is gone, shrank, and eventually disappeared. So you see that use dependent, right? If you use, or you don't. So is that like a random? That is, uh, you know, uh, in my paper, I have uh, also in discussion several other papers. They are thinking that uh, that. During that reorganization, some changes networking occurs, and that could be one reason of phantom limb syndrome, but it is not, you know, yet uh, fully understood. That is one possibility that active re reorganization can cause the phantom limb syndrome. Yes. Professor Chowdhury, yes. will I put uh, another practice with VF5 today or tomorrow? I'll post another VF5 tomorrow. Thank you very much. If you don't see, just email me tomorrow. Will do. You said it would be here. Uh, I'll be honest. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.